would you do in the late 1840s to seek wealth? Sierra Nevada Mountain Branch is one place to go for some gold and opportunities. Do you want to learn how to play Sierra West board game? In this video, we're going to take you through the full rules for this game. And if you stay tuned till the end, you can pick up some tips and strategies along the way. Coming up. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Equal University. We bring you a variety of Call of Duty board game videos. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing and do hit the bell to be notified of when we post new videos. Now let's get to the rules of Sierra West, designed by Johnny Peck Canteen and published by Board and Dies. In Sierra West, players play the role of pioneers heading west to California trying to make their fortune. On each round, the player's two pioneers will head out around the boards, taking actions based on the cards in the player's hands and the cabins that those players build. Through the game, players will be collecting resources, advancing on tracks, moving their wagons, and mining new cards from the mountain to gain access to new and better actions. Once the mountain is all but depleted, players will earn points based on how far they've advanced on wagons, tracks, cards, as well as trapping animals and building cabins, and the player with the highest score wins. Sierra West is effectively four games in one. The action selection system is utilized across four completely separate modules, Apple Hill, Boats and Banjos, Gold Rush, and Outlaws and Outposts. Most of the rules are the same between each of the modules, but each of these adds a new way of scoring points and a new area of focus. We'll be taking you through all of these modules in this video, after we've taken you through the basic rules of the game. If you want to skip ahead to a certain module, you can refer to the index in the description below. We're teaching from a pre-release copy of the game, but we are missing a few of the final components, and so you'll see a few print and play or borrowed components through this video. To set up the game, you'll first need to sort out the cards. Find all of the cards showing a mountain peak, including the ones which have icons down the bottom. Go through the deck and separate all the ones showing the icon on the back. This will give you four piles of six cards, one for each module, and the rest. Flip them over and then sort the rest by the icon in the top right corner. You should have four piles of 15, one representing each of the modules, four piles of eight, each in one of the player colours, and the remaining 16 cards are combinations of a player colour and a module. For the time being, you can put these with their player colours. The cards showing these two backs are used for the solo game, so you won't need them now. And the remaining cards are module specific, and we'll come back to those later. You'll choose the module that you're going to play with, in this case it's Apple Hill, and take both the 6 card and 15 card mountain decks associated with that module. Decks for the other modules are all returned to the box. They are not used. Each player takes a deck in his or her colour, and you'll proceed to set up. Next, you'll lay out the 21 module specific cards into your mountain. And this layout I'm about to describe holds for all modules except Outlaws and Outposts. First, take one of the special cards and place it face up underneath the first step of the wagon track here. Then shuffle each of these decks individually and lay them out in the following pattern. You'll see that the special cards are laid out on the bottom corners of the mountain, the middle of the second row, and the edges of the fourth row. This layout is for the three or four player game. In the two player game, you'll move the two special cards from the corners of the bottom up to the second row. Flip the top two cards face up. Each player places a frontiersman on the base strip of the mountain and a wagon on the leftmost step of the wagon track. Next to the mountain, you'll place the homestead scoring board and each player places a disc on the zero step of each track. Each player takes a slotted player board, two dissimilar meeples and the matching colored player deck. Find the card corresponding to the module that you're playing and place it on the bottom of your draw pile. Find the card corresponding to each of the other three modules and return them to the box, you won't be using them. Then shuffle the remaining eight, place them on top of the draw pile and draw a starting hand of three. 
Each player also takes a set of five dissimilar animal tiles. The four basic animals and the one showing an icon corresponding to the module. Return any others to the box and flip them all to the face down side. Seed the cavern market with four face up cabins from face down pile and then choose a first player. You're now ready to play. On each player turn, a player will use the three cards from hand and the two meeples on the player board to take a sequence of actions. This is done without interference from opponents and once the sequence is finished, play passes to the next player who does likewise. Understanding how to put together your sequence of actions on a turn is the most critical part of understanding this game. And so we'll go through that in detail now before we talk about what the actions are. To start your turn, you'll take the three cards from your hand and you will lay them out in any order but in this configuration. First placing one card into the middle, touching this shorter tooth, and then over the top, laying the other two cards like so. If you've done it correctly, you'll have one unbroken green path at the top and one unbroken tan path at the bottom. The icons that remain visible are all of the actions available to you. You'll have green path actions, tan path actions, and three actions at the top of the cards called summit actions. Entering your turn, if you've built cabins already in this game, and we'll talk about how you build them later, you'll also have cabin effects available. Next, you will plot your sequence of actions, and you do this using your two meeples. Each meeple has a defined path that it can take. The hat meeple can go to the tan colored cabin, then up to the green path and along the green path from left to right and then up to any one of the three summit actions. You can see the hat wearing meeples outline on these two locations. The hatless meeple can go to one of the three green colored cabins. Here I have only one cabin built but had a second been built the meeple could still go to only one of those cabins. Then the meeple can go to the tan path, once again traversing it from left to right, and then, like the hat wearing meeple, can go to any one of the three summit actions, excluding one that is already occupied. Once again, you can see the hatless meeple's outline at those cabins and at that path. Each individual meeple may only move forward on its path, but one meeple does not need to complete its path before the other one begins. And working out how to sequence this is the major part of your puzzle in Sierra West. For example, the hatless meeple could move to this cabin, then the hat wearing meeple could bypass its cabin, go straight to its track, and take four steps along its path before the other meeple leaves its cabin, takes three steps along its path, and then the first meeple continues and finishes. As long as each meeple moves only forwards, any sequence in this manner is allowable. There are two major reasons why you might want to sequence your actions in this way. Firstly, some actions will cost you resources to take, and so you may need your other meeple to collect resources before you take it. The second has to do with the way that the cabins work. Each cabin has an effect which enhances an action for its matching coloured path. Here, for example, it makes the one boot action equal a two boot action. This effect is valid only while there is a meeple in that cabin, and so it would be necessary to send one meeple to that cabin while the other one walks over each of the single boot icons in order to gain that bonus before sending your other meeple on. A side effect of this is that you'll only ever be able to utilize one cabin in a round, because to actually utilize a cabin you need one meeple in that cabin and the other on its track. A couple of other notes on taking your actions on these paths. Firstly, there are two actions on the tan path which have a resource cost to take. This one costs a single resource and this one costs two. Resources are paid from the three basic types of resources in the game, stone, food and wood. Neither gold nor any resources specific to a module can be used for this cost. This cost is in addition to any cost that the action itself may carry. The second is that while most actions in the game are optional to take when your meeple reaches them, any that have a red outline, like these apples or this bear, are mandatory. This means that you must take the action 
when your meeple enters or crosses that space. If you do not wish to take the action, then your meeple must stay put, and it will forego any remaining actions on the track or the summit. Finally, you'll see that there's an animal icon visible on your left and right cards. These have no impact on the active player's turn, and I'll come back to what they mean later on in the video. After the player has finished taking all actions, return the meeples to home camp, discard all three cards that were used in this round, and then draw three new cards into hand. These will form the basis for the player's next turn. Play then passes to the next player, whose turn follows in the same manner. If you'd like to come back and review that section again after you've learned what all the actions in the game are, you can use the index in the description below to come back and see the turn flow section again. Now we'll go through all the different actions which are common to all modules of the game. The most basic sort of action in the game depicts a resource, and when you take that action, you gain the corresponding resource. This can be the three basic resources, stone, food or wood, or it can be gold. Some more powerful spaces will allow you to gain two resources at once. The next action is movement, represented by the boot icon, and this can either be a single boot for one movement point, or a double boot for two movement points. Movement points must be spent immediately and cannot be saved for later. Movement points may be spent in one of two places, either moving frontiersmen up the mountain or moving wagons along the wagon track. To move your frontiersmen, spend one movement point to move from wherever you're currently located to an adjacent card. All six of the bottom cards are considered adjacent to this bottom strip but from that point forward, you'll be limited to cards adjacent to the one you're on. Multiple Frontiers people can share the same card. Ultimately, you'll be trying to move your way up to a face-up card, as claiming cards using a separate action is one of your major ways of building up your points and your pool of actions. To move your wagon along the wagon track, you'll need to spend one or two movement points and some resources. You must have the resources available at the time you make the movement to be allowed to take the action. So your first wagon step will cost you one movement point and any one basic resource, while wagon movement later in the game will be substantially more expensive. As you move along the wagon track, you'll create a multiplier on some of your endgame points, and you will gain access to more of these cards showing below the track but we'll have more on this in the module-specific portion of the rules. Movement points in one turn may be split between your frontiersman and your wagon. A related but different action that you may come across is this one, showing a pair of boots inside a circle. When taking this action, you will gain a pair of boots token. This token gives you some flexibility, and at any later time on one of your turns, you may spend this pair of boots token to gain two movement points immediately. Another related action which is present on the summit is this one here showing a wheel. The wheel is another way to advance on the wagon track and when taking a wheel you'll move your wagon one step ignoring any printed cost on the board. So when taking this action the player would pay two gold then advance one step. The next action is the shovel, which allows you to take one construction action, either building a cabin or taking a card from the mountain. Because of the way the cards are laid out, shovels are always in one of these two spaces, which costs one or two resources to do. To build a cabin, the player chooses any one of the four face-up cabins and then pays its cost. For the oldest cabin, this just costs a shovel. For the newest, it's a shovel plus a pair of boots token. This cost is in addition to the cost printed on the player board. Pay the resources and then take the cabin and place it onto a matching coloured space on the player board. The cabin is permanent and if you have no space for a certain colour of cabin, you cannot construct that cabin. And note that this grey cabin space is used for a different action, which I'll go through shortly. If you chose not to build the oldest cabin, then discard that cabin as well as part of the action. Then slide any caverns remaining over to the right and refill the market from the top of the stack. If you take multiple shovel actions in the same round, you will have a completely refilled market to choose from. The other way to utilize the shovel action is to take a card out of the mountain. To take this action, your frontiersman must be 
on a face-up mountain card. Spend the shovel and then take the card. This can be placed either on top of your discard pile or on top of your draw deck, depending on whether or not you wish to draw that card next round or not. Your frontiersman is returned to the base of the mountain. Any other frontiersmen who are on that card are also returned to the base of the mountain, but the player who owns that frontiersman takes a pair of boots token as compensation for losing the movement. After taking cards from the mountain, any newly revealed cards should be flipped face up. If they are a special card that's associated specifically with this module, remove it immediately and place it onto the next available space at the bottom of the track before again flipping any newly revealed cards. The next action is the mule, and when a player takes the mule action, that player gains the mule token. There is one mule in the game, and it will stay with the player who has it until another player takes the mule action. The mule serves as a third meeple that can be moved over the player's actions during that player's turn. However, the mule's path is more simple. The mule may first go into the mule cavern, and from there straight up to an unoccupied summit action. In this way, a player with the mule will be able to take all three summit actions on a round. The action in the mule's cavern allows the player to exchange gold for other resources. Since most of the actions in the game require the basic resources rather than gold, Having the mule to convert your gold into these resources is a necessary step. As for the other cabins, you can only make these changes as long as the mule is in that cabin. If you still have the mule at the start of your next turn, you'll be able to use it again. The next type of action, available as a summit action, is to spend resources to advance on a homestead track. Spend the resources shown at the top of the card and then advance your disc one step up the matching track. This may be done only once per summit action. After advancing on the track, the player who advances will gain the benefit printed at the top of the column. This can be the mule, a pair of boots token, or a gold. At the end of the game, each player's progress on these tracks will be worth a number of victory points. Multiple players may share the same space on the track, except that only one player may reach the top space. The Homestead Track action introduces one of the two out-of-turn actions that players may take in the game. When an opponent goes up on one of the Homestead tracks, each other player may commit one of the two meeples to this space here. The mule may not be committed there. Doing this allows the player to gain one resource matching the track that the opponent went up on. This meeple then stays there until that player's turn, and starts the turn there. This effectively counts as that meeple's visit to a cabin for the round, and so when Green's turn begins, this meeple will not be able to go to one of its cabins, it will move straight from here onto its path. There is room only for a single meeple on this space, and so the player cannot gain resources in this way, more than once per round. The next action is the fur trade, and to understand how this works, we need to first talk about the other out-of-turn action you can take, trapping. Recall that on each player's turn, there will be two animal icons visible on that player's mountain. All other players may choose to trap one of those animals. To do this, the player commits a meeple to the trapping space. Again, this must be a meeple, not a mule then pays any one basic resource to trap the animal. To trap the animal, its tile is flipped from the face down side to the face up side. Once trapped, that type of animal cannot be trapped again by the player, and that tile remains face up for the rest of the game. Multiple opponents may trap the same animal, and whether or not an animal is trapped does not impact the active player's turn. Once again, there is space only for a single animal to be trapped by a player per round, and that meeple will start its turn from this space, missing out on visiting the cabins and moving straight to its path. So returning to the fur trade action. When a player takes this action, the player gains the resources associated with each animal that the player has already trapped in the game. 
as it lies here, the player would gain a wood, a stone, and a food for taking that fur trade action. All of these animals remain face up and will generate the same resources again next time this action is taken. The final action in the base game is the bear, and this is a mandatory action, as you can tell from its red outline. To resolve the bear, you simply pay the resource costs printed underneath, one or two resources. If you cannot or do not wish to pay the resource, then you must take damage. Taking damage means either discarding a cabin from your player board, or moving your wagon one step backwards on the wagon track. If you have no cabins and you're yet to move your wagon, then you ignore taking damage. All of the other actions in the game are associated with the specific modules, and so I'm going to take you through the end of the game and scoring before taking you back to talk about each of the four modules in sequence. The end of the game is triggered when the last of the scenario's special cards is dug out of the mountain and placed below the track. You'll finish the current round of play up to the player with the first player token, and then complete one more round. Then proceed to endgame scoring. The following endgame scores are present in all four modes of the game. For each of the three homestead tracks, multiply the value reached on the track by the multiplier reached by your wagon. Here, blue has reached levels 2, 3 and 4 on the three tracks, and 3 on the wagon. So this adds up to 9, multiplied by 3 for 27 points. Then sort through all of your cards and work out how many cards you took off the mountain. These will be the ones with the stars. Score a number of points based on this table on your player board. So here, six cards is worth 20 points. Score one point for each piece of gold and each pair of boot tokens that you have left. Other resources are worth no points. Then lose three points for each cabin slot you've failed to build into and for each of the five animal tiles that you've failed to trap. To all of those scores, add anything which is specific to the module that you're playing. The player with the highest score wins. The first module in the game is Apple Hill, and this is the module recommended for your first play. You'll set the game up as normal, randomizing the locations of the six special cards, and you'll add these two sideboards. The Apple Resource Track, which has a green and red marker set to zero, and the Apple Homestead Track, on which each player's fourth and fifth discs are placed. Green and red apples are two new types of resources, which are shared collectively by all players. When a player gains apples, this marker is moved up on the corresponding apple track. When a player spends apples, the marker is moved down. Any apples that are left over after a player's turn remain there for the next player to use. Any time an action is taken which involves apples to be gained above the maximum of six, any excess is lost. New actions in Apple Hill are as follows. There are several actions allowing you to gain a certain amount of apples of different colours. You'll notice that all such actions are mandatory with the red outline. So even if you have no intention of using those apples, you will still need to gain them and leave them there for the next player. Another way to gain apples is through the harvest action, and this one is not mandatory. If you choose to take the harvest action, find the position of your wagon on the trail, and then add a number of apples based on the cards that are below and to the left of your wagon. Green harvesting here would gain two green apples and three red. The other module specific actions are summit actions which allow the players to spend the collective's apples on their own resources. This can involve making trades of apples for other resources in the game, or spending apples to move up on the corresponding apple homestead track. Resource trades can be done as many times on the action as the player wishes, homestead movements can happen only once. The Apple Homestead tracks allow richer rewards for the players who move up on them. The green track lets the player take the fur trade action, and the red track gives the player two gold. Furthermore, opposing players cannot use the tracking bonus on an Apple movement. Additionally, multiple players are allowed to reach the top of the same Apple track. At the end of the game, you'll score each of these Apple Homestead tracks the same way as the other tracks. In other words, you will multiply your position on the track by the position of your wagon. Add this to your score from the base game, and the player with the highest score wins. 
the Boats and Banjos module introduces the river to the game. This gives you the opportunity to pan for gold or to go fishing. Unlike the basic resources in the game, the fish tokens are limited and you will have to remove some fish tokens from the game if you're playing with fewer than four players. To set up the module, in addition to rationing out the fish, you'll place the starting river token down here and place each player's canoe onto it. Choose one of the river cards at random and place it into the first slot on the wagon track and seed it with the printed resources. The other five river cards are distributed randomly through the mountain. The Boats and Banjos module adds the following actions to the game. First, panning for gold. To take this action, look at the current position of the player's wagon, and then take the leftmost remaining resource from each card to the left of or underneath the player's wagon. This can be a handy way to get extra gold and stone. Once a card is empty, no more resources can be taken from it. Next, there are three actions relating to movement and actions on the river. The double paddle action allows you to move your canoe up to two spaces along the river. The multi paddle action allows you to move to any space, any distance away on the river. Note that you can go further down the river than the current position of your wagon. The hook represents the fishing action. To take this action, look at the current position of your canoe on the river and then gain a fish matching each of the river cards on your current position or to the left. So in this case, the player would gain two white fish, one black and one pink. Remember that the supply of fish is limited and so if there are no fish left in your colour, you miss out. You'll also notice that all the cards allowing you to fish have no actions on their green path. So now, let's look at what you can do with fish. Firstly, there are summit actions which allow the player to cash in basic resources for fish or to cash in fish for homestead track advancements. Secondly, returning your canoe to the fish market space allows you to immediately make any or all of the fish trades printed here. Individual fish can be exchanged for the matching basic resources or combinations of fish can be exchanged for gold. Any time fish are spent in any of these manners, they return to the general supply, able to be fished out again. The final new action is dueling banjos. This requires a bit of coordination between your two meeples. The way this will work is that if this meeple goes onto the mandatory banjo space, the meeple will take damage. Unless the other meeple has already moved onto the dueling banjo space and activated it by paying the resources. With this meeple keeping the banjo player occupied, the other meeple may sneak past without taking damage. At the end of the game, there is no scoring outside of the base rules. Leftover fish are worth no points. The next module is the Gold Rush module, and in this you'll be creating a mine along the bottom track of the board, and you'll be trying to increase the value of your gold. When setting up this module, you'll need to layer the special cards. Find the one showing a campfire, and that is the one that starts down the bottom. The two that show level one are placed on the upper part of the mountain, and the three showing level two are placed down the bottom. You'll also need the lantern and dynamite cards, which will sit off to the side to start with, and a stack of mine carts whose size depends on the number of players. New actions for this module are as follows. The lantern action allows the player to take the lantern card. Like the mule, there is one of these in the game and it will change hands anytime someone takes this action. The next action, represented by this pickaxe, is mining, and this is where the player will try to gain gold out of the mine. To take this action, the player looks at the current position of the wagon and then adds up the number of gold icons on mining cards underneath or to the left of the wagon. Dark caverns showing this lantern icon count only if the player has the lantern card. So with the lantern, the blue player would be mining up to five gold. Without it, it would be up to four. What this count actually represents is the number of resources the player will mine. Blue will definitely mine four resources. Then roll the die to see how many of those resources will be stone. On a one or a two, 
it'll be one stone, on a three or a four it'll be two, and on a five or a six it'll be three. All the rest of the resources mined will be gold. In a scenario like this, where the player is mining two resources and rolls a six, that player would only get two stone. A player taking the dynamite action may take the dynamite card. And like the lantern card, there is one of these which will pass around from player to player when this action is taken. A player with the dynamite card, at any point during that player's turn, may exchange two stone for one gold, and may do this as many times as desired. The next action, available on the summit, is to purchase a minecart. The player pays two stone and then takes a minecart token from the supply. If there are none left, the player cannot take this action. The minecart serves as a place to load gold to increase its value. A player may load one or two gold nuggets into a minecart by taking this action. Each minecart has the capacity for two gold, and once the gold is placed there, it is there for the rest of the game. It can no longer be spent on any other actions. But at the end of the game, any gold in a minecart is worth three points instead of the normal one. There are no other new actions in the Gold Rush module, but you will notice that there are a lot more summit actions which allow you to pay gold to take an effect. In the base game, you'd normally need to use the Mule's Cabin to convert that gold into basic resources in order to take those sorts of actions. At the end of the game, any gold in a minecart is worth three points instead of one, any gold which is still outside a minecart is worth one point as usual. Additionally, the dynamite and lantern cards are worth three points for the player who holds them at the end of the game. The final module is Outlaws and Outposts, and in this module players will be attempting to win gunfights against outlaws for extra points. The setup for this module is quite a bit different to the others. Instead of distributing the special cards through the mountain, they will all go along the side and they'll be numbered from one at the top to five at the bottom. The card showing a campfire starts face up in the trail. On each of the outlaw cards, you will place a number of outlaw tokens, which depends on your player count. You'll also place the sheriff card near the board and each player takes one of each of these two cards. Players will track the amount of ammunition they have by sliding this card up and down to reveal the number of bullets in the player's supply. The following actions are unique to this module. The Sheriff action allows the player to take this Sheriff card. Once again, there is one of these in the game and it will be passed around from player to player when this action is taken. Several actions allow the player to collect bullets. This one is worth a single bullet. This one is worth two bullets. And this one which will cost resources, allows the player to completely fill up to six bullets. Players can then spend their bullets on their summit actions. Some summit actions allow resources and bullets to be spent together to advance on homestead tracks. Others, indicated by these two icons, allow the player to engage in gunfights with the outlaws. With this action, showing the target symbol, the player spends two bullets to engage in a gunfight with rifle. The player then takes one outlaw token from the highest remaining outpost in the mountain into that player's supply, ready to be scored at the end of the game. Once an outpost is depleted of outlaws, the card is removed from the mountain and placed face up in the next step of the trail. The other option is to engage in gunfight using a six shooter, and that is represented by this icon. To do this, go through the following steps. First, check the location of your wagon on the trail and see the number that's underneath it. This is what you have to roll on a six-sided die to successfully defeat an outlaw. For the blue player here, a five or six is required. Then, one at a time, you will take shots until you either run out of ammo or successfully shoot a bandit. Spend a bullet, roll the die, and try to hit your target. If you are holding the Sheriff's Badge when you go into this sort of battle, you get to add one to each die roll. So in the blue player's case here as the Sheriff, the player would be trying to roll at least a four. If the player runs out of ammunition without capturing a bandit, then the bandits shoot back and the player must take damage. 
Remember that this means either losing a cabin or moving backwards on the wagon track. If the player is successful, the player takes an outlaw token into the supply ready to score at the end of the game, and the gunfight ends. Additionally, if the player has the Sheriff card, that player receives a gold as a reward for shooting the Outlaw. As usual, the game end will trigger when all of the special cards have been removed from the mountain. When the last card is placed, you'll add five Outlaws to the base of the mountain. And these five Outlaws can be targeted between the end game trigger and the actual end of the game. In final scoring, in addition to the base scores, you will also add a number of points equal to the number of outlaws you've captured, multiplied by the multiplier on your wagon trail. And the player holding the sheriff card at the end of the game gains three extra points. The player with the highest score wins. The game comes with a solo mode designed by David Turchi. In the solo mode, you have an Automa opponent whose actions are controlled by these cards. On each turn, you'll draw one card, and then the highlighted arrows will tell you which actions from the previous card will be executed this round. One of these cards exists for each module in the game, and this tells you the module-specific actions that the Automa will take. We're not going to take you through the full solo rules for the game in this video, but you can read them on page 28 of your rulebook. And that's how to play Sierra West. We hope that you enjoyed this video and we hope you enjoy playing. If you enjoy this video, please let us know by hitting the like button, write your questions or feedback in the comment sections below. You can also join our Facebook group, Meeple University Community, to share your love for board games. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first notified of what's new from Meeple University, please consider subscribing to our channel by clicking on the Meeple in the corner and do hit the bell to be notified of our new videos. Until next time!